interested in taking a deep dive each week into a compliance or compliance-related topic? Then Compliance Into the Weeds is the podcast for you. Join Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, and Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, as they go into the weeds to flesh out a story which you can use to better inform your compliance program. Both you and your compliance program will be the better for listening to this podcast. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, the voice of compliance, back again with Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, uh, also the founder and editor of Radical Compliance, for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Last week, we had our first SEC exclusive FCPA enforcement action involving Cardinal Health, and Matt and I are going to take a deep dive into it. So, Matt, uh, first of all, welcome, and I need a check-in. Are you under quarantine or are you uh, currently status is good? Uh, status is good here in Boston. I can tell you the one coronavirus case that we had, we had one early on who was immediately quarantined at Mass General. He has been cleared and apparently is now back at home or wherever he is that he came from. Um, but we have outbreaks in Rhode Island. We have them in New Hampshire. We have them in New York. So we are slowly being encircled here in Boston. But as of right now, everybody is healthy. You know, that's such a Bostonian outlook on the world the rest of the world just circles around us. It's good to know. We are you, the hub of the universe. You guys are still the city on the hill. 300 years yep. after uh, the uh, Pilgrim's Land and Boston gets founded. Well, good job. So Cardinal Health, what were uh, your initial observations, Matt? You know, it's funny because at first I read uh, the SEC complaint, and I suppose we should give some of the, the facts here. Um, But at first, I thought this was going to be another humdrum case of a big U.S. company acquires subsidiary overseas, which Cardinal did, and uh, then had some sort of poor due diligence. And, you know, we've heard that plenty of times before. Kind of sort of like that, but I'll run through the facts of it. So Cardinal Health is a very large pharmaceutical distributor worldwide. And in 2010, it uh, entered the Chinese market by acquiring a Chinese subsidiary of some other established pharma distribution company. Um, And then it became Cardinal China after the acquisition. Uh, But prior to that acquisition, um, the existing business had this longstanding agreement with its customers, where, as I understand it, basically uh, Cardinal China operated and maintained on its own books the financial accounts of its customers. And whenever the customers were making a profit, the Cardinal would book and keep that profit in a separate account for the customer. And then the customer would be able to, its employees would be able to access those accounts and make payments from them and everything like that. So you've got a lot of payments going on that a third party is making through Cardinal's own financial books. Um, without much clarity into what are these payments? Where are they coming from? Where are they going? Which alone, I read that and I just, I pictured legions of compliance officers wincing as you might read that kind of arrangement. Um, And I figured this would be about Cardinal not understanding all of the risks around something like that. And then, you know, hijinks ensue. To my surprise, uh, Cardinal actually understood This is a sketchy thing. Cardinal China should not do this. Uh, So they knew that there were FCPA-related risks here with this arrangement, and they told everybody to knock it off, um, or they told Cardinal China to cut off all of these customers using this kind of intimate arrangement with Cardinal's own books. And Cardinal China did that for all except for one customer, some European uh, cosmetics firm. I don't know which firm. And it was their employees of the cosmetics firm who were technically Cardinal China employees who were making payments through Cardinal China's own books, and they became bribes for the state officials. Um, So I actually see that as more of a command and control breakdown because Cardinal knew that this was going to be a mess, told Cardinal China, don't do it, and Cardinal China did it, which is a different sort of – oh, we've heard that before – but it's not necessarily a due diligence failure, I don't think. But, Tom, that was my first take on it. What's yours? 
So the the European aspect of this really intrigued me, Matt. And the uh, first, I thought that they uh, Cardinal made the mistake of thinking, well, this is Europe, so it's going to be lower risk, and they didn't mm-hmm. put it, as much rigor around. Um, the entire operation as they did in China, recognizing that China is generally viewed as a higher risk. So at first I thought it actually might be a, a due diligence or at least a risk assessment or risk perception issue. The second thing was that the business relationship um, was e- either a subcontractor relationship, sort of an outsourced relationship, it was a something different than a straight employer-employee relationship. And that was really the part that intrigued me because it was clear that the risk was not either identified or properly evaluated based upon this different business arrangement. And it really, uh, the first thing I thought of actually was a franchisor franchisee. Because Maybe, yeah. Franchisors, uh, when you talk to them about their potential FCPA risks, they say, well, we can never be. Uh, at risk because we are not responsible for the conduct of our franchisees, to which I always say, do you keep a percentage of their profits? Well, of course we do. That's how we make our money. Well, if they engage in bribery and corruption to make a sale and then that uh, gets reported up and you get a percentage take of that, five, six, seven, whatever the percentage might be, um, that you you have risk there. Um, here, was not a franchise or a franchisee, but it was some other type of relationship that uh, I didn't think had been properly evaluated. Um, it also brought up the potential issue of uh, outsourced HR, outsourced compliance, outsourced a lot of things in the administrative function, uh, and there was really no handle on that from the corporate headquarters. So I, I have the SEC order right up in front of me on my computer. I'll, I'll read it out for the listeners here because it is – Bizarre, and I've been trying to figure out you know, what what was this that they were doing. I haven't heard of this before. Cardinal China formally employed twenty four hundred employees for that cosmetics company, pursuant to an administrative and HR services agreement. Okay, um, but the twenty four hundred reported on a daily practical basis back to the cosmetics company anyway. Um, and most of these 2,400, they're, they're like beauty assistants at a retail shop in Beijing or Shanghai or something, but roughly 100 of them were employees in sales and marketing and management for the cosmetics company, and they're doing the cosmetics company's bidding, but they are doing it while legally and financially under the auspices of Cardinal China. And that was the sort of thing where I, was, I thought my first reaction was this stinks of risk to high heaven. Because, of course, uh, the sales employees are accessing these accounts that are actually on uh, Cardinal China's books, and they're making payments, and Cardinal China is just cutting checks. Um, and it's it's stinky. It's weird. But the th- other thing that sticks out to me is that apparently, before Cardinal showed up, the predecessor company did this with a lot of other businesses and thought this was a good idea. And Cardinal shows up, says, knock it off. But they told them to knock it off for all of these customers, including several other European firms. And there was one that was an Italian firm and one that was a British firm where Cardinal got the sense those European firms are using this arrangement and our books to make suspicious of payments terminate it. And so they they understood that this was a risk, that the nature of the arrangement was a risk, not necessarily that – Europeans taking advantage of this are less risky than, say, Saudis or Indonesians or Russians or Chinese or whoever. They understood this is a bad idea, period. European customers are not who are doing it with us this way. End it, and then they ended it for all except this European cosmetics firm. And my question is why? Like how did you misassess the risk for these guys when you clearly understood the principle of this arrangement was a big risk unto itself? Don't do it. And yet still somehow it wound up getting done. So I keep coming back to what was the command and control compliance authority from Cardinal back in the U.S. that they couldn't get this done. Like I said, they they did this deal in 2010. They knew this was an issue by 2011, told Cardinal China to stop it off, and it didn't stop it until 2016. So that's a big thing. I, I don't know what the answer is, but those are the facts. 
Well, you know, A.J. Hinch destroyed the monitor that the Astros used to steal size on the baseball bat, not once but twice. And that message didn't get the attention of uh, the players. So uh, I guess it doesn't surprise me, or I don't find that as unusual, that um, Ch- uh, Cardinal China didn't uh, respond. I put the fault actually more on the corporate office uh, it's their subsidiary. They can tell them to do yeah. and make them do. But the um, the other thing, Matt, is it drove home to me that uh, we talk about uh, due diligence and contracts around commission sales agents, third parties, joint venture partners. But in the business world, there are just a plethora of business relationships you can have. Um, yeah. Ne- neither you nor I can really figure out what to characterize this as. And it just drives home. You're only limited by your imagination and you've got to put the same rigor around uh, a imaginative third party relationship uh, as you do around a commission sales agent, a joint venture partner or or something else. Um, There's one other thing that really struck me about your blog post that I really wanted to explore And in your third section called Satisfy Prudent Officials, you point out that uh, the SEC imposed a $8.8 million fine and 2.5 of that was for a civil penalty. And you identified this as extra damages. You compared it with the Juniper Network. So I wanted to really see what you saw of the significance of the civil penalty as opposed to uh, the remainder of the uh, total fine. What struck me is that um, if you're getting illicit profits from improper payment schemes and you have to give that up, okay, uh, you know, that's fine. That is proceeds of a crime of some nature. So you're going to have to give it up. And that I don't that doesn't strike me as news, but um, it's the further like inability to address the problem that is happening that winds up getting a civil penalty. That would be my interpretation of it, Um, where. What we haven't mentioned yet is that several times as all of this misconduct is happening between 2011 and 2016, uh, cardinal executives did get clear red flags from people in China who jumped the queue and went over Cardinal China's head directly to Cardinal U.S. to say, we have some fears about this. Uh, You know, there were internal reports that went directly to the U.S. executives Um, There was a regulatory action in China by Chinese regulators who were dinging Cardinal China employees with this cosmetics company and this bizarro arrangement. Like um, there was an antitrust violation that Shanghai authorities imposed a fine on Cardinal China for doing this. And, you know, clearly U.S. executives should have known we're getting internal reports Local regulators in China are taking action against these arrangements. We've already told them, knock it off, and it's still happening. Those are clear red flags, and for whatever reason, Cardinal U.S. executives could not get this problem resolved. So I don't know if that is a weak structure overall in their compliance program. I don't know if they're turning a blind eye because they thought it was a lucrative deal, Um, but it was – in an in ineffective tone at the top. I don't want to say weak or careless or deliberately ignorant. I've got no idea why these things weren't getting addressed, but they weren't getting addressed. And the reason that made me think of Juniper Networks was that enforcement action that happened last year where, correct me if, if you know the numbers and I get them wrong, but I think it was about an $11 million total fine against Juniper and six and a half of it was a penalty where Juniper – knew in 2009 that its Russian subsidiary was engaged in some funny business and improper payments, told the Russian subsidiary, do not do this. And the Russian subsidiary kept doing it for four more years. And it wasn't until after 2013 or 14 when Juniper did restructure its compliance operation globally that finally Juniper got to crack down on its Russia subsidiary. I, we don't necessarily know where the when the come to Jesus moment happened here with Cardinal Health, but at some point, Cardinal Health did finally decide to crack down on its China uh, subsidiary after telling them don't doing it. 
uh, don't do it. After getting several more red flags that it's still getting done, and then more time passes and more time passes, then finally in 2016, an internal audit turns up evidence, and for whatever reason, Cardinal China finally decided, or Cardinal U.S. finally decided, we're putting a stop to this nonsense in China. We're self-reporting to the SEC. They took all the other remediation steps. That's great. But there was this period of ineffective compliance function. And that's where I start to think, well, you know, you're asking for an an extra penalty then if you can't get anything done, because that's really what matters. Matt, I guess the final thought I had was, uh, once again, following uh, several SEC exclusive enforcement actions in 2019, uh, we had a, a relatively small penalty, but we had a lot packed into the actual cease and desist order that you and I can uh, slice and dice. But really, for the compliance practitioner, lots of uh, significant lessons. Did you see something different in the order? Um, well, what struck me was that, you know, so the fine is small. Let, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, Cardinal Health makes about $145 billion with a B, $145 billion in revenue a year. It has $2 billion in operating profit. So an $8 million or a $9 million fine is chump change. It is. Um, That's not surprising because uh, this administration just generally is not very heavy on corporate penalties, period, nor is this SEC. Um, But, you know, it didn't seem to me like Cardinal Health was making a lot of money from this operation, So what struck me was that there was an ineffective compliance program. So whatever 2.5 million is out of 8.8, what is it's more than 25%, probably less than a third. I I don't quite know. But let's say about 30% of the total fine was a penalty for this relatively small amount. But if you scale this up, let's say they were making 100 million a year. Let's say you're making tens of millions in multiple countries doing something like this. You know, this was a very small, focused piece of misconduct that wound up getting an extra 30% on its fine simply because the compliance function was inadequate. So I could see if you scale up to a global scale, you know, we don't have good compliance in 19 different jurisdictions that are making a zillion dollars each, you are going to get a significant penalty. I suspect. Um, Even in this anti-penalty administration, you're still going to see something like that. Um, So really more than anything else, like I said in my post, this strikes me as a lesson about command and control in your compliance function, that when the senior executives order a subsidiary, stop doing this, you got to make sure they stop. Um, And that's not what happened. And I mean, there's, there's not much more to say about it. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great point to end on. Lots to really dissect in this, Matt. So we'll link to Matt's uh, blog post in the show notes. Uh, I will have a blog post up by then, so we'll link to mine as well. So, Matt, I look forward to seeing what next week brings us. Thank you, sir. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks again for joining us on this episode, and I hope you will join us again next week where Matt and I take a deep dive, literally going into the weeds on a compliance topic. Thanks again.